Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure to join you here for the second Sunday of this new year. And as you can see from this slide, just as a reminder, we are beginning the book of Exodus today on this day. It has 40 chapters, so this time you have to do a little less reading a day, approximately six chapters a day, and you'll be all caught up. Of course, today's message is going to reflect on the lessons we learned from Genesis. Genesis has so many lessons that I had to kind of decide how to do this. So I hope that you find the lesson today a good reminder of what you went through in Genesis. As I had said before, when we talked about the Bible last week, Genesis tells us how humankind ended up divided between two families, basically, and how the Lord brings reconciliation among them. We see the beginnings of peoples and nations and how these turned against God. However, when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to see how God's plan came together at the end, and we look forward to the conclusion of that drama when we understand that God's intent was to save multiples of nations from every tribe, language, and culture to come back as his people in the new heavens and in the new earth. So taking a look at Genesis, we can say that it is a unique book in the sense that it does cover the widest period of time of human history. Right from the creation week until Abraham, which is Genesis chapter 11, Those first 11 chapters of Genesis cover almost 2,000 years of history. That's a lot of time, considering that from Abraham to Jesus, there was another 2,000. So you can kind of see the timeline here, how it breaks out in relation to the book of Genesis and the rest of the Bible. Notice also that from Genesis, the the first 11 chapters in Genesis, we're focusing on worldly events Whereas the last part of Genesis and even the rest of the Bible really is focused on one family, uh, beginning with Abraham, through the nation of Israel, and then, of course, Jesus Christ. So that's the Genesis timeline in a nutshell. If we look at the outline of Genesis, we can kind of see that same breakthrough there. I I don't expect to go everything on this outline. I have it here just for your benefit in case you want to take a picture of it or see it later. Uh, It kind of divides everything up, but the biggest division or the main division in the book of Genesis is Genesis 1 through 11, focusing on those first 2,000 years of history, and then God zooming in and focusing on this one family, Abraham, after we see what happens. And really, what happens in Genesis? Well, at the beginning, we just see a big division here between two families. We see a family feud here, if you will, between Seth's lineage and Cain's lineage. In the lineage of Seth, we have people who ended up honoring the Lord. They sought to lean on him, sought to obey his commands. They depended on the Lord's provisions and they called on the name of the Lord, as we see at the end of Genesis chapter four. However, when we take a look at Cain's lineage, we see that from Cain, he kind of left his family. He's the first one to leave them and head into a different part of the land. He rejected God and everyone that stood for God and tried to lean on his own understanding. And we see, though, his lineage doing the same thing. We see that towards the end, especially towards uh, uh, when Nimrod comes into, into play here and he wants to make this Tower of Babel. What was the main concern between his people is to make a name for ourselves. They wanted to become the most important people. They rejected God. They didn't seek him. They sought to make a name for themselves. 
And that's why among Cain's lineage, we see individuals uh, using their wisdom, depending on their own wisdom and skills, depending on their own technology to make tents, to make other things, and also seeking to be entertained. We see that it was in Cain's lineage uh, that the musical instruments get developed and any other such thing. So what happens here? Well, eventually, even though we have two families that get divided up, eventually evil overtakes them all. Right before Noah's account in chapter 6, we're told that the sons of God married the daughters of men. Boy, people have made all kinds of wild theories about what that means in the Bible. But the simplest explanation, really, when you look at it in the Hebrew, is that the sons of God stand for the righteous seed or the seed of those who sought to please God, basically Seth's lineage. Whereas the daughters of men were the daughters of Cain's lineage, a Satan's seed or Satan's branch. So because they started to intermarry, uh, evil kind of overtakes and everything becomes ruined. And by the time God looks upon the earth, he sees that everything, uh, his plan went awry. Everything was ruined and there was really only one man that did right and found favor in God's eyes. And God spared him. Noah at that point became a, a mediator, a type of mediator for the entire earth to start all over again. He was the only one who found that favor in God's eyes. So the Lord spared him when he washed the earth, saves him, saved him by the means of his wisdom, even though the rest of the world at that point had made a technology and wanted to make a name for themselves, apparently their technology and their wisdom wasn't enough to save them. But God gave this man Noah his technology, gave him wisdom to build this boat and thus save Noah. They depended completely on the Lord for giving him this means and this wisdom through an ark and by water to save them. And that has become now the symbol for us, even to this day, as 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 says, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this has become the everlasting symbol now until the end of time, that first cleansing, the cleansing that saves us now by faith. And it's not a, a cleansing that saves us just because the water is doing something to our body, as Peter points out here, but it's a pledge of a good conscience. So we can say that by trusting Christ, we are becoming kind of like Noah and receiving not a righteousness of our own. We can't say that. I mean, Noah considered, uh, God considered Noah righteous, but we're considered righteous by placing our faith in Christ. But in the same way, we are also saved by this cleansing, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So God starts again with this man. He starts the plan of repopulating the earth. And we know that through his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the world gets repopulated again. And this map kind of gives you a, an idea of where each of them went. They kind of went in different directions. Shem is actually the father of the Semites. Shemites, Semites, you see the similarity there. The people that dwelt in the land of Israel, Palestine, and Saudi Arabia. Ham, though, became, Ham went south uh, into Africa, and he became the father of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and the Canaanites. And then we have Japheth. Uh, Japheth's descendants ended up going northward, settling in the regions around the Black and the Caspian Sea and becoming the fathers of the Caucasian races of Europe and Asia. So the second half of Genesis, now God zooms in on a particular family, and that's the family of Abram. We see Abram's family tree here, starting with Terah at the top, uh, who was Abraham's father. And he focuses in on one family, the family that he's going to choose to bless the rest of mankind, the first real kind of mediator or type of Christ that uh, would bring birth to the nation of Israel through which Jesus would come. And you see this phrase getting repeated throughout the rest of Genesis from the time God speaks to him in chapter 11 and 12 
all the way to the very end to when Joseph dies. At the very end of chapter 50, Joseph, Joseph repeats this same phrase that has been told to Abraham and all the rest of the patriarchs repeated. And which phrase is that? We find that in Genesis 12, verse 3, that all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you, that all families of earth may be blessed. So God's intent, he didn't forget about the world. We may think when we read throughout Genesis that now that God is only interested in this one family that he kind of forgot about everybody else. But no, repeated throughout this promise that God continues to remind all of the patriarchs. What is the promise about? God wants to bring blessing to all the peoples of the earth, to all the families of the earth. But he needs a mediator. He needs someone that God can consider righteous enough to continue this righteous seed. So we see God involved, right? God is not a, this distant God that he's kind of over there and kind of lets people do his own thing. Quite the opposite. We see in Genesis God's direct hand in these families to keep this righteous seed even to this day through the church. The fact that the church of Jesus is alive and well, as Jesus promised the death of Hades, would never overcome it, indicates God's direct intervention in preserving a seed for the purpose of blessing all the families of the earth. So we see that theme throughout all of Genesis, given to Abraham, given to Isaac, Jacob, and even Joseph repeats it at the end to kind of close in full circle this purpose that God was bringing about. So as the rest of the world was focusing on making a name for themselves uh, with their technology and their wisdom, uh, God looks for a man, Abraham, who was not looking to do that. A humble, a kind, a generous man, a man of peace to carry his righteous seed forward. And we're going to see that feud even to this day. We see that feud. What is the feud between the world and the church? The world that leans on its wisdom, on its technology, for its salvation, for its prosperity, to make a name for themselves versus the people of God who choose instead to lean on God's wisdom and to preserve his word and to not make a name for themselves, but point people to the name of Christ. And that's the difference that we still see to this day. That feud began in Genesis and we still see the results today. So in Abraham, God chose this man to carry this righteous seed forward. We know Abraham and Sarai, they couldn't bear children. So that was considered a curse in the ancient world. So who would look upon a, a, a couple that was infertile to carry the righteous seed forward? See, when the world looks at the weak, the world looks at weak people and judges them as weak as incompetent, as incapable. Those are the very people God chooses because God seeks to glorify his name, not ours. We want to be different from the world in that way. We're not here to make a name for ourselves. We're not here to exalt the world's wisdom or technology as some sort of savior. No, that's the pattern of the world. That's the pattern of the seed of Satan. We want to be of the seed of God declaring one name above all names and honoring God and leaning on his wisdom. And that's what we are trying to preserve here as the seed of God. Even though we're going to feel pressure from the world, probably like Sarah, she felt the pressure. She was barren. She hears God giving Abraham all these promises that they're going to have kids. And she's like, well, I don't know where they're going to come from. I can't have any kids. And so at one point, right, uh, the pressure becomes so great that she decides, well, you know, Abraham, I think, I guess we got to do something about this because God keeps saying that he's going to bless us, that we're going to have children, but nothing's happening. So I guess we have to take matters into our hands. And brothers and sisters, that's a big point in Genesis, a big lesson for all of us that God includes here. Because like I shared with you before, God is transparent. In, in these accounts of these patriarchal families, man, we see a lot of bad stuff happening. You know, and God doesn't make any apology. He says, yeah, this is the people I'm dealing with. 
but they're there for us to learn something. That, that Yes, you know what? As God's seed, we're probably going to make mistakes. But even as we make mistakes, God is willing to work with us, even through those very mistakes, to continue pushing his righteous seed forward because God's going to get all the glory in the end anyway. However, some things for us to take notice is that we are going to suffer consequences for some of the errors that we make. I mean, look at what happens here. Instead of being an aid, instead of Sarah's decision to give Hagar to Abraham and say, okay, I guess, I guess we got to take matters into our own hands. I guess we got to use our own wisdom and insight here to see how we're going to make God's promise true. But what happened here, instead of furthering God's promise, her decision and Abraham's follow through, kind of like Adam and Eve, right? We got the woman here again proposing a plan. And Adam says, sure, why not? What happened? They caused the fork in the family with the birth of Ishmael, who becomes the father of the Arab nation, with whom to this day we still have strife, as God himself prophesied. So here we find some very, the, the first of the very practical applications we see in Genesis. What happens here? When we take matters into our own hands, we sometimes make God's promises more difficult for us to achieve. We're not going to get in the way of God's promises because God is going to make his promises happen regardless of what you decide to do or not to do. God's word will be fulfilled. But wouldn't you rather his promises be fulfilled through you by being obedient Instead of by God saying, okay, well, I guess you're not in my plan anymore. I'm going to use someone else. Because as Jesus himself said, God can raise rocks to cry out to his name and give glory to his name. So we want to take this lesson to heart. Don't try to take matters into your own hands. You know, we have to wait on the Lord. If you do, though, if you decide to take matters into your own hands and end up messing something up, God will still bless you if you remain faithful. But nevertheless, you may have some strife now in your company that you're going to have to deal with. And so that's the mark of Satan's seed right there. You know, the mark of Satan's seed is to take matters into their own hands, leaning on their understanding and leaning on their means, usually their own technology to do so. But we as the righteous seed need to learn to be different from that. We need to learn to trust God, to accept what God has given us. The book of Ecclesiastes has some very sober knowledge about this. If you want to live in peace, learn to accept your lot. Learn to accept what God has given you. And within those things God has, has given you, be patient always and seek to look to him and honor his name as opposed to deciding, well, I want to make a name for myself. I want to make a name for my family. I want to do this. I want to do that. And hey, you may end up doing it, but in the process, you could end up losing your faith as well. Or you can end up gaining more strife than if you would have trusted in God in the first place. So these are some very important lessons to make sure that we're distinguished uh, as God's seed, as, right, as the righteous seed, as opposed to Satan's seed. So the chosen seed continues through Isaac, nevertheless, even though there was Ishmael and, there were, and Ishmael also was going to become the father of 12 tribes, just like the 12 tribes of Israel. God chooses to continue the seed through Isaac. But as well, Isaac and Rebekah, they struggled. They also were not able to bear children. Did you know that they were 20 years without any children? But they do uh, something different, didn't they, than Abraham and Sarah? Instead of Rebecca saying, hmm, I cannot bear any children, let me give you my maid, as my mother-in-law had done, Isaac instead chooses to pray to God about his wife's uh, not being able to bear, and God blesses them with twins. So we see something a little different done here with Isaac and Isaac lived a pretty peaceful life. We didn't really read about nothing happening to him, you know, any weird stories or anything coming from his lineage. Maybe he was a man who learned from those hard lessons his father had to go through. And uh, we see him uh, do well. So even though the oldest 
at the time when they had those twins, the oldest, Esau, was to inherit the blessing, we see a switch. We see it was the younger who was chosen to inherit the blessing, despite his life of deception and scheming, which is an interesting story there that we read in Jacob's account. So Jacob strives to have children with Rachel, but guess what? She is barren. <laughs> it's always happening. See, God chooses the weak among us. Didn't Paul uh, quote that in Corinthians? He said something like that in Corinthians. God chooses the weak. Uh, the rest of the world pities us, but that's who God chooses. So we need to be happy. We need to be satisfied with being the rejects of the world. Because being a reject of the world could mean that you're one of God's chosen ones. And that's, I think, another point that is subtly made throughout all these events that we see happening here in Genesis. So most of Israel's children were born from Leah and her maid and Rachel's maid. There were only two children that Jacob had through Rachel. However, something interesting happens here that we don't see happening in the lineages before. Because if you look at this family tree, God always chose one and rejected the other to carry his seed. But when we get to Jacob, all 12 of Jacob's children are chosen now to carry the seed forward as the nation of Israel. So it seems that at that point, God was going to, he had in mind forming that nation. Even though Jacob had snubbed Leah, we see the character of God here in choosing to bless her with many children and even the chosen seed, the Messiah, which was to come through Judah, the fourth child that she had. And it, as if the lineage couldn't get crazy enough, there's a chapter in the Bible that you might think, well, why is that chapter there? Why are we told in Genesis chapter 38 about Judah and this business with Tamar? You know, what, what's going on there? Why, why so much information? Tamar, if you recall, was uh, Judah's daughter-in-law, but something happened. Her, her husbands kept dying. <laughs> That's because they were wicked, you know, so God took them out. So she didn't have any inheritance. And we're talking about Judah's lineage here. So it was like they were triply cursed here. And remember, Judah was the lineage chosen to deliver the Messiah. So we have this chapter 38 there to kind of tell us, well, you know what? In the crazy plans that sometimes man and woman make, that you would be like, man, this is an ungodly thing to do. Yet... Through those very things, God is able to work his purpose. And so we see that God's purpose is sovereign above any choice that men or women might make, whether in wisdom or whether in folly. God will see his purpose through. And so that should give us assurance as we read of these crazy family feuds and stuff that happens. You know, Tamar first had married Ur. That was Judah's first son, but he was wicked, so he perished. Then she married Onan, and, you know, Judah told his son Onan, hey, you know, your, your first brother died, so, you know, it's good for you to marry his wife so that you can carry on his legacy. But Onan also dies for his wickedness. So Judah had only one son to left, left to give her, but he was like, I ain't giving her my son because two of them died. He might, the third one might die too. So he had fear, and because of fear, he withheld his third son from her. So now Tamar has to take matters into her own hands. Kind of like what uh, her great-great-grandmother, you know, Sarah and Rebecca. Well, Rebecca didn't do it, but Rachel did. Uh, so we see the women kind of saying, okay, I'm going to do something here. But it ends up being that Tamar was righteous in what she did. I'm not going to get into the details. You can read about that, and or you probably read about it, about it already. And so in Matthew, when you read the genealogy of Jesus, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, this small portion of the genealogy reads, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah. Now, Perez and Zerah, were the sons born of Tamar with Judah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron, and so goes on to the genealogy. So it's awesome to see how God works into the genealogy of the Messiah, the chosen one, 
such people with, with such plans of craziness and deception right there built into it. As we know, Rahab, even who was a prostitute, was built into his genealogy. So that just, that just fills me with, wow, you know what? It doesn't matter what happens. God is going to see his purpose through. All that I need to remember is that I want to have the characteristics of the seed of God, of the righteous seed. People who rely on God, people who seek God, people who want to glorify Jesus and not be the kind of people to glorify myself or seek a name for myself or seek wealth or treasure or glory and honor for myself because those are the characteristics of the world. God is not going to bless the families of the earth through that, through those kinds of people. He is going to bless the families of the earth through the people that seek to glorify him to the people that seek to declare the name of Jesus Christ. And that shows the character of God. Here, even though Tamar, uh, going back to the story of Tamar, even though Tamar had done something that under the law was considered wicked, uh, Judah recognizes, wow, Tamar, you are more righteous than I for looking out to seek the continuity of this heritage, of this lineage of God's chosen people. And so we see in that the character of God, how God makes it right when women are repudiated like Tamar was. Uh, he shows himself to be merciful and compassionate. Even Leah, right? She was kind of repudiated by Jacob, but God blessed her with children. So throughout all these stories, we see the mercy and the compassion of God, the kindness of God, even when people were making decisions that were not good. So we come to Christ in Genesis. Where do we see Jesus in Genesis? Well, he's first spoken of right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God is handing out the punishment for disobedience, uh, speaking to the snake or speaking really to, to Satan at this point. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That word offspring there is the singular word seed in the Hebrew. So it's not offsprings or seeds. And Paul also makes that correction in the book of Galatians, I believe, when he's talking about the seed of Abraham being one particular seed that we're talking about, who is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he is the foundation of the blessings that will come upon all nations through the lineage of Abraham. So we also see Christ through all these different types of Christ in Genesis. Through Adam, Adam being the first man, being made in the image of God, the first creature to be made in flesh in the image of God. That is a type of Christ because Christ also came in the flesh as Adam did. Melchizedek makes his appearance. And we spoke at length about Melchizedek in the study on Hebrews, but he is the king priest. That comes bringing blessing. So he was a type of Christ blessing Abraham. Because remember, it's always the greater that blesses the lesser. So the fact that Melchizedek gave a blessing indicates how he was greater than Abraham. We have Isaac was a type of Christ because Isaac voluntarily gave himself up when he understood that he was to be a fragrant offering of God. He didn't resist his father Abraham when he was to be laid at the altar. And he was a, we think that he was of age, like maybe between 16 and 20 years old at the time when Abraham was going to offer him in Mount Moriah. So he could have easily resisted and said, no, I'm not going to let you do this. But we see how he, he voluntarily did it. And we also see Christ as a type in Joseph, my favorite story of all of them in Genesis, because Joseph suffered. And his story takes up, you know, a good number of chapters in Genesis there. And we get a lot of details. He suffered a lot of abuse. He suffered rejection at the hands of many people. But yet he was exalted to save his family. He was exalted way above any other human capacity to exalt himself uh, by God's grace in order to save the remnant of Israel from the things that were coming, which was a famine at his time. So he, we see in him a type of Christ as well. So because of Jesus' offering, we now can be a part of this family, of the righteous seed. 
as we're all incorporated into the righteous family tree via the Messiah. If it were not for the Messiah, we would not be part of these blessed people. We could not be incorporated into the seed, into the genealogy of the righteous seed if there was no Messiah. We would be part of, of uh, Cain's seed, you know, out there to depend on the world and its wisdom, you know, to fight and claw our way to some sort of survival in this day and age. But no, thankfully, God accomplished his purpose. You know, uh, Abraham begat all the patriarchs and they eventually begat the nation of Israel and God saved Israel, as you're going to read this week, from Egypt through Moses. And so that continued all the way until Jesus Christ came, which is why Paul says, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. What a beautiful verse that it has all been accomplished. Isn't this, isn't this awesome? I mean, we are very blessed people, just like the song says, it's a beautiful time. It's a blessed time to be alive because we can look back throughout all this history and without any doubt, we can quell our doubts actually and quell our fears by saying, wow, look at all that God did. We have all this evidence happening. God preserving a family lineage and, and the Messiah came. I mean, we live at a time when we can say, yeah, God fulfilled it. The Messiah did come and he was raised from the dead. His grave is empty. It all happened. And now I can become part of this blessed, of this righteous seed. No matter what I have done. No matter who I have uh, pledged my allegiance to in the past. I can change. I can become incorporated into this righteous seed. And so God's promise, God's doors to his ark, to his church are still open. His promises are still available to our generation and the generations to come because of Jesus Christ. And this was the promise all along. You know that God was going to atone. Atonement needed to happen. Because we just like Cain. Decided to become friends of the world. Instead of friends of Christ at one point. And we wanted to rely on worldly wisdom. And technologies. And, and go into the way of the world. As opposed to trusting God. But thankfully God was merciful on us. If we're present here today, we heard the gospel. We believe this gospel that God did send his son to atone specifically for people who were his sworn enemies from the line of Cain. And we have his tomb, his grave to this day before us, empty, showing us that the Messiah is not here, but he is in heaven and he is coming back. Romans chapter 425 says Jesus Christ was raised for our justification. So the fact that the tomb is empty, indicating that Jesus was raised, means that the plan for justification was complete. That I can also receive justification, even though I am guilty, even though I doubt, even though I have a lot of issues, I can receive justification by having faith in Christ. And his tomb stands as a witness to us and to everyone else that this justification is available. By his resurrection, we are saved. That's what 1 Peter 3.21 said, you know. By his resurrection, we are saved. Our justification comes through his resurrection. So nowadays we can cash into this promise by giving up our life, by repenting, by changing our mind, by deciding, you know what? I don't want to be a part of Satan's seed. I don't want to be a part of the people that relies on worldly wisdom and technology to save me. Because even if it can save me, it can only save me to a certain extent, meaning the flesh. But no worldly wisdom or technology will be saving me from death. That's for sure. And certainly not getting me into heaven. Something that worldly wisdom or technology doesn't even have the capacity to understand or even fathom. So it's very limited. And the more that we realize that, the more I think we would be inclined to say, you know what? I think it is much smarter for us to be and the family of the righteous seed. Is there a way that I can be incorporated into that lineage, into that family tree of the righteous seed? Yes, there is, by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was God's intent all along so that all of the families of the earth 
can be blessed. Now we can be blessed by all being incorporated into Jesus' family tree in this way. There is still a feud, though, as I said before. There are children of the light, as Paul says here, live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord and have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And right now, you know, I could have chosen today in today's sermon to talk about what probably a lot of other people are talking about this Sunday morning. All the rioting and the revolutions and the nonsense that goes on in the world. But if I were to talk about that, that wouldn't really help you because all those things are just symptoms. Symptoms of one cause. And what is the cause? Being part of Cain's family tree. Deciding that I'm going to be part of the family tree of Satan's seed, of the unrighteous seed. Because that's what that results in. Worldliness. And worldliness, no worldly wisdom, can save you from the folly that will overtake you when you decide to make that your lineage. There's only one way out of that lineage. Not even on your own worldly wisdom can you get out of that lineage. For Jesus says there are two roads. There's the narrow road and there's the broad path. And most people follow the broad path. And we see that in Genesis. Most people went with Cain. Most people decided to not even look at God or acknowledge him. Even back then, even when God was right before them, <laughs> they decided to do that. But those who seek the truth, those who, like Paul says here, are on the side of goodness, righteousness, and truth, those are the few. The few, the proud, the greedy, the few, the humble, the Christians. Those who decide to follow into that narrow path will find blessings forever. And those are the children of light. So the choice is yours to make. Which lineage am I going to follow? Who am I going to be like? And I encourage you with this last passage. With these words Jesus said to Pilate. When he was being judged, he said, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I hope that you are listening and trusting in the words of truth. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.